or say, or y'all want me to say all this again? <laughs> can you remember it? Maybe you can remember it. Um, so I didn't intend to say any of this, but since we're here, I'll say it. So, uh, for uh, for example, let me let me just give you in the book of James. I've been this before, but it doesn't. I'm like Peter. I, I, it doesn't bother me to put you in remembrance of what I've taught you before. So in James, uh, in the first chapter and first verse, uh, I'll go to. Uh, I'll go to screen sharing so you can see it. I may get off of it in a minute, but um, here, I'll screen share this with you. In the first chapter of James, it says, James, a servant of God of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. This is James of Alphaeus, James the apostle, the, the, I mean, this is James, the Lord's brother. Uh, I'm sorry, the, but J the, the other James, John and James, the sons of Zebedee, that James was martyred early, the first martyr. So this was written by him, and he's talking to the 12 tribes of the Jews. And so I'm just giving you that scripture to show you that James's letter was to the 12 tribes. There's almost, I'm trying to think if there was any other letter to the Jews other than the Hebrews, which was probably written by Paul, all the other scriptures that you have outside of the four gospels and acts was written to the Gentiles, um, including the book of, including Peter's books. And anyone wants to ask me a question, you can. Uh, but here in James, I believe in the fifth chapter, um, right here, and the seventh verse, it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. He's talking to Jews, the 12 tribes. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. I would say that the early rains of the Jewish world was in, under the law and the latter rain came on the day of Pentecost or the Passover. Um, so be ye... Uh, what he says, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. See, James is telling them the Lord's coming soon, and he's talking about him coming in judgment there to finish making up his bride before AD 70. So the day of the Lord was well on, well in, uh, uh, in the workings or in it, it was going on the day of the Lord was a 45 year period from the day of Pentecost to AD 70 um, or even a little bit past AD 70 I think their last prophetical hour extended there a little bit but anyway I won't go into that but here James is telling the coming of the Lord and that he was waiting for the precious fruit of the earth and he had long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain that was of the jewish world um but then when you go to second thessalonians the second chapter paul tells them now we beseech you he's talking to a gentile church and if you didn't understand this you would you think the Bible contradicted itself. But he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter is from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. So here he's telling them, don't let anybody tell you that, that the coming of the Lord uh, is, is going to happen soon because it's not going to come. Now, there's a falling away first. We understand that the body, that the early church fell away and the Lord's not coming to the Gentile world until the church is restored. So our early reign, I would say the apostle Paul planted the Gentile work and the early rains fell back there on apostle on the apostle Paul's planning and we will not see the latter rain until the church is restored uh, and that's when God will begin the harvest in the end of the Gentile world so uh, I'm just saying we, we need to be thankful that, that God's give us, brought us through another year uh, of what we've, uh, what the Lord's brought, and we're looking forward to the new year. And um, so um, that's not really what I was going to talk about tonight, but since I got on it, I thought that I would maybe say something uh, along those lines, just concerning the early and latter rain, that if you study it out, you will find out that there was an early and latter rain every year, uh, naturally, and there was a spiritual early and latter rain. It's shown there in the book of James. He's talking to them, telling them the Lord's coming. He's fixing to come, and he meant in judgment and make finish making up the bride back there before AD 70 and before the falling away of the church, the Lord's coming in final judgment was going to take place. And they knew it was soon. God had waited for that to make up his, the bride portion of the early church. And so, and now we, the Gentiles, the early rains came back there on Paul's planting and We've come through a great winter. In fact, it says that, doesn't it? In Songs of Solomon, um, is that the fourth chapter? Let's see, is that the second chapter of the Songs of Solomon? Somebody can, let me look in the sec. Is it the fourth chapter or the second chapter? I'll look right quick. Um, second chapter, verse 11. Second. Yes, verse 11 here, for it says, For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is gone, is over and gone, and the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle, that's the turtle dove, the Holy Ghost, is heard in our land. The fig trees put forth their figs, and the vines with tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. So we've come through a winter or a uh, wilderness, you know, a falling away, a dark age. Uh, there's, there's not anything been brought forth in, in a harvest. I was going to say earlier, I used to say that it used to be wrong. And I, you'd say, you know, that in the, in the springtime, the, the sun got closer to the earth or the earth got closer to the sun. Well, it, I've, I've studied that out and that really is not what happens. What happens is, is the earth tilts in its orbits and it gets more heat from the sun. So we are getting heat from the sun or that we hadn't got all winter long. That's what determines our, our, our seasons. And so in the springtime, we are receiving judgment. We're receiving heat or judgment from the Lord. And that's what brings forth. That heat is going to bring forth a harvest and bring forth the seed that's been waiting all winter for it to come forth in harvest. It grows a little bit, barley and wheat does during the winter on warm days, but it'll never 
never bring forth a harvest. I heard Brother Leninger on tape recently. He said, you know, you can't say, you know, we're going to have a harvest of wheat in, in Kansas in October. <laughs> he said, it don't bring forth no wheat in October, even though we may have some wheat plants coming up. Uh, cattle may be able to eat some of it and warm days, but it's not going to be make wheat until May or June. In, in Kansas. So it's just something to understand. Uh, we've come through the winter and the sound of the turtle dove. We're, we're coming in the end of the Gentile world and our uh, latter rain is going to fall. That's why I want to say something here. I feel like one of the things that we need to really work on right now is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The foundation, I believe, of the early church was what Jesus gave out in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and what Paul gave in, in 1 Corinthians 13th chapter on, on charity. I think those are foundation teachings in the Bible for the early church, and I think we need to get back to that. So looking in the fifth chapter of, of Matthew, I'd just like to say a little bit here. Uh, Jesus, it says, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and, and when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The, this is a foundation to us of, of being poor in spirit or humble enough to receive the things of God. I've got here Isaiah 66, 1 through 14. I'd like to read that. Uh, I actually will bring it down here. We can see it better. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool where where is the house that you build it unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things have my hand made and all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is, is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as, is as if he slew a man. He that sacrifices a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I will bring uh, I will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because they called, when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that which I delighted not. What he's talking about here is it became a ritual that had lost the true meaning of the Lord's true requirements for sacrifice. It just, the sacrifices was such a ritual to them. It didn't matter if they was cutting off a dog's neck or offering up swine's blood or burning incense to an idol. They had no true feelings or meaning towards a true sacrifice to God. And if we're not careful, I've said this before that I made the statement like this recently that uh, we cannot get away from uh, true righteousness and how to find true righteousness in God. Um, <clears throat> the, the mechanics of the body of Christ are necessary, but you cannot put your focus on mechanics and not on 
the true spirit of righteousness, of the true uh, humility of serving God, and the true uh, relationship that we're to have with Christ. There's, I've seen this in the body, and I've been here well over 40 years, over 43 years. And so I've seen churches that equate their righteousness with their standards, uh, their order, and those are mechanics that are necessary, but you can't get righteousness through standards. See, if we learn the foundation of having the right spirit in serving God, we'll have the right standards. It will call, it will bring the right standards. Teaching standards as a law will not make you righteous, but teaching the right spirit of humility, serving God, and the right relationship with God. And that's what this fifth, sixth, and seventh chapter of Matthew is all about, is how to have the right spirit of serving God and building our relationship with Jesus, with God through Jesus Christ. And it starts out with a poor spirit. And this is the person that God's going to look to is those that is of a poor and contrite spirit and that trembleth at God's word. Uh, he goes on here in verse five saying, hear the word of the Lord. You that tremble at his word, you brethren that hate, your brother that hateth you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before she her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall the nation be born at once? This is talking about the day of Pentecost and those, those, 12, that, those 12 disciples and the 120 that were followers of Jesus that waited for him on the on the in the upper room for the Holy Ghost. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her. See, that's his next uh, statement concerning uh, 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 in, in, I mean, concerning Matthew 5, 6, and 7. See, his next statement is, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's talking about people that are really... Uh, are crying out to God, seeking for God's to, to really uh, give them uh, his, what he, you know, in other words, when you really start looking to God for salvation and you really begin to cry out to God for him to begin to help you because you recognize that you're in need of God and you're in need of God's righteousness, and that you're lacking what, what you know that God has more for you, but you, you don't have it, and you begin to mourn and cry out for that, God begins to answer that. That's why he says, you know, the next is blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, here in Psalms, let me read Psalm 76 to you. I'll just bring that over here and be easier to see. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem, that's the early name for Jerusalem. 
in Salem or Jerusalem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword and the battle, Selah. That word Selah means think about it. Meditate on this. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout hearted are spoiled. They have slept their sleep and none of the men of might have found their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into a dead sleep. Thou, even thou art to be feared. And who may stand in thy sight when, the, when once thou art angry? Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth. See, God, that's who God's going to save. He's going to save the meek, those that are poor in spirit, humble, and that they have learned to get quiet before God and, and let God begin to work in their life. They recognize their need for God. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He's terrible to the kings of the earth. I was telling someone today, I said, I talked to several ministers today, and I was telling them, I said, uh, we cannot have an oligarchy in the body of Christ. An oligarchy is where a few rule to serve their political means. Um, there was a, a few that ruled in the early church, 12 apostles that ruled with with they had, you know, that woman had a crown of 12 stars in her head. But those men were not political. Those men were servants of righteousness and served God's people without any strings attached. They didn't, they weren't bosses. They weren't men who forced, forced oversight. They were men that served the people of God with the righteous word of God that they had received from the Lord Jesus Christ and that spirit, you know, so, uh, Ephesians 4 tells us that there's one Lord, there's one Father, there's one faith, there's one spirit, there's one baptism, but the spirit's what I wanted to mention. That spirit is the spirit of Christ. The body of Christ has a totally different spirit God looked in the early, in, in the, during the dark ages, when Catholicism ruled a wicked rulership over God's people that martyred millions of people. Um, when God started the Reformation, he allowed and put in the hearts of those reformers to put in those organizations. It wasn't, this wasn't God's order, but it was the best God could do for people at the time. He allowed them and put it in their hearts to have a democracy in their order. God was not, uh, his order is theocracy, not democracy. But to protect the people because they had been misused so much, God allowed democracy where they could set up uh, a council, uh, trustees, elders that could vote preachers in and vote them out. See, God had to do something to protect people from the evil rulership. And when God, and, it, and that democracy remained in Protestantism and Pentecostalism until Brother William Souders got a revelation of the body of Christ. And when God 
gave us that revelation, we were not a righteous, we were not a righteous rulership. There's been hurt in rulership. We're ha we've had to learn in the body of Christ how to rule righteously, and we don't have it right yet. But God is God, uh, God the Lord is building this ref this reformed church, this restored church. And God's going to have men, just like that early church, before it's over with, God will have men that are servants, that are poor in spirit, they're meek men, they mourn for the things of God, for the people of God. Their whole service is going to be for God's people, to serve God's people with the righteousness that God's delivered to them to give his people. That's this foundation that Jesus put in that early church to those men back there. And it's necessary for us to maintain working on this foundation. Uh, this is, this message is a doable message. We may have to practice it before it becomes a part of us. In fact, we do and will have to. But it is, it is the foundation of true righteousness and the true servants of God. Blessed are they, verse 6, that which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It takes a true hunger. I had a cousin one time by the name of Bill Sutmiller. That was Joe Sutmiller's brother. And when he first came to the body, he and I were very close. I mean, we were close. We were, I, he's the only man I could say to you that I was closer to than a brother, other than Johnny Bud became a closer friend than that to me. Mother Bill, my cousin died. His mother and my mother were sisters. But he and I were very, very close. And it, when he first came to the body, he used to tell me, Brother Smith, I don't have what y'all have. I want what y'all's got. He did, it took him a while to get the Holy Ghost. He couldn't get it right away. He was a sincere man. And he kept telling me, Brother Smith, I want y'all what y'all have, but I don't have it. I know I don't have it, but I'm seeking for it. And I used to tell him, Brother Bill, keep asking God. You're hungry and you will get filled. You'll get this. Just keep seeking God for it. He go to he had a little metal building. It was a like a eight by eight or eight by ten store, little storage, one of those little metal buildings out behind his house. And he'd go out there every day and take his Bible. We built him a little shelf in there and he'd sit down in a chair and pray every day and read his Bible and ask God to give him. Let him have a vision of the body of Christ. He wanted this, what he was feeling in the body. He wanted, he wanted to get the Holy Ghost. He wanted the spirit he was feeling. I just kept telling him, Brother Bill, you'll get it. Just keep after, just keep seeking God. And it wasn't too long after that that he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And God began to use him. And of course, he finally became a pastor. In McAllister, Oklahoma, he built that church. He was the founder of the McAllister work. And, uh, but I'm just using him to show you that if you hunger and thirst after the true righteousness of God, you will get it. God will not shun anybody. It's not God's will that any perish, the Bible says, but that all come to righteousness. Even though that's not God's will, they won't all do it because everybody's not hungry. Everybody won't get poor enough in spirit. Everybody's not going to mourn and cry out to God. Everyone's not going to get meek enough. Uh, you know, we all have to continue to work on this. We have to continue. These foundation teachings of Jesus Christ have to be in our hearts, and we have to work for them. I mean, when you read these, you know, <laughs> When you begin to read this and, and you see, I, I tell you it's doable, but you have to you have to work and seek God to help you to get these this right spirit in you. you know, blessed are the peacemakers. It's hard to, I mean, this we get on down here in a little while, 
and God starts telling you to love them that hate you <laughs> and, and them that persecute you, to pray for them, to have a good spirit for them, to want to bless them, you know, not hate your enemy, but to love them. This doableness of this gets to be a little stiffer. But if God, if the Lord will help us, and give us the right spirit of, of meekness, and, and we really want to be righteous, and we want to defeat evil, we'll work on these things. And these things is not something once God develops this in your Holy Ghost nature, you, you won't have to always work on this. It can become a part of you. You can become righteous. You don't, that's what I was trying to tell uh, in, in the Zoom ministers meeting a couple of weeks ago when I was down in Mexico. I said, you know, they misunderstood me. You know, they thought I was telling them, you can't have charity right now. You're going to have to wait until the harvest. Well, I, I was saying you cannot be perfected in charity until then. But just like you, you start off with faith, you start off with virtue, you, you, you have knowledge, you have a measure, you've got a measure of faith, you've got a measure of all these things. You can have charity in a measure, but you can't get, that. I'm talking about when you read the 13th chapter of of, of First Corinthians, it here, let, let me just go to it here. And um, I think God loves us. I know Jesus loves this message. And, and I know we, we've got many things to work on, but this we got to we have to continue to work on this foundation. And of course, it's in my heart for the for this year, for the first of the year to get us back working on the foundation, not, not focusing on the mechanics of salvation. You know, if we focus on the law of standards, the law of order, yes, there is standard. Yes, there is an order. But I'm telling you this, you get this foundation in your heart, all of us, including me, we keep working on this foundation, you won't have to teach standards. People will just live right. They'll dress right. They'll have the right order. If they have this, if they have this spirit that that Jesus taught, you will automatically, and it won't be, it won't be mechanics to you. It will be the right behavior that the Holy Ghost will help you to have, you know, nobody had to tell Brother William Sounders to quit smoking his pipe. He was just on his, he was just serving God and trying to live for him every day. And one day after he got saved, he reached in his pocket and pulled out his pipe. And he said, I heard a voice that said, huh, uh, and he realized it was God. And he just put his pipe back in his pocket and God help him to overcome that. And uh, that's what I'm saying. This spirit of the foundation of having the right heart towards God, the same spirit we had when we sought for salvation, when we sought for the Holy Ghost, that's the spirit that will, that will cause us to really be righteous in our hunger and thirsty, sought, seeking after that righteousness that will cause us, if, if we keep learning, it takes knowledge, you know, uh, but we can't, if you can, what, what did uh, Paul say? Well, let me just turn to it here in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, here, here's what he said. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and not, and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to be fed to the poor and give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. But here's what it says. 
charity suffers long. Now, what it's saying is, it's not charity. It This is what charity does. It's what charity is. It's not something you try to be. Charity is the love of God. That charity is a goppy love. That's what it is. It's a goppy, the goppy love of God. And it's not filial love. Filial love is brotherly kindness, but charity is the love of God. And when God perfects that in us, we, we have to put it on, you know, like be clothed in charity. We're working on it. Uh, we have to push the old man back and do the things <clears throat> that's out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, that is our Holy Ghost nature. That's where we got to serve God from. And that will, that true charity will come out of that Holy Ghost nature. And it finally will be developed in you and overcome the Adamic nature and the Adamic spirit that's in you. But charity is that, that it is that love of God. And it don't behave itself unseemly. It doesn't envy. It suffers long. It's kind. It vaunts not itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. It seeks not his own, but it seeks others for others. That, you know, that, that's totally opposite of the Adamic nature. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't think evil. You know, I was reading about Brother William Sounders today where he was saying, do not try to judge anybody. Don't take rumors. If you didn't see it with your own eye, don't believe it. <laughs> because if you didn't see it and it becomes, somebody tries to tell you something that another person tells it before you know it, the person that's telling it is worse than the person that they heard done it that they don't even know if they done it. And he said, you can't judge God's servant like that. You, you, you need to leave that alone. Let God take care of that. Be careful about carrying rumors and carrying uh, unrighteous thoughts in your heart about your brother. Just charity believeth all things. It, it hopes all things. It endures everything. In fact, it never fails. The love of God will never fail you, but everything else will. <laughs> and so this is the this is the nature of Christ. It's it it is what he became when he was perfected in the love of God. And that's what we that those are found this is foundation that we've got to keep seeking God, that we can operate in the Holy Ghost nature. And let this, the spirit of Christ work in us until it becomes a part of our character. That's who we become. And so I just wanted to go over some of these things tonight. Uh, we, I want to work on them some more. I, wanna, I want you brethren to work on them with me here in the local church. I want you to help me to, to squeeze all the good that we can get out of these, this foundation of being poor in spirit and, and a uh, mourning and having a being meek and hunger and thirsty and merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. But we, we can go all, I mean, this is just the fifth chapter. There's a six and seven chapter. And I think it's time here in the early church for us to work on some of these things and get back to being the salt of the earth the light of the world, you know, uh, how well does your light shine? Uh, you, you won't be popular among the ungodly if you shine, if your light shines very bright, <laughs> but you will find people that are hungry for God. That, that may tell you something that when they get in trouble, you're the person they're going to call. They're not going to call their ungodly friends for help when they get in trouble and when they, when they, when, when life goes bad for them, they're going to be looking for somebody that knows how to get a hold of God. 
Um, so what does he say here? Whosoever, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. See, they, he gives them to them as commandments. So it's obedience to do these things until they get formed in you and shall teach men so. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. But whosoever shall do and teach them, but do them, not just teach them, but do them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> he couples that with our righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of, of the right of the religious spirit that's in Christianity, or that was like in the scribes and Pharisees in the Jewish world. He said, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven if you don't surpass that. Anyway, I, I, I won't go any, any further tonight, but I want to work on these things for a while. I feel God in this and that we, you know, uh, we can get to study for knowledge. And, you know, I teach a lot on the book of Revelation, and I think that's important. But I don't think it's as important as foundation as this foundation. It, knowledge is not near as important as having the right spirit and the right heart, the right desire to serve God in righteousness. So you can get exalted about knowledge. You can get you you can get exalted about wisdom or faith or or standards or any other anything else. But that's not near as important as having the right spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And he gives this beautiful foundation in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's in Romans 7 and 8. Also, 6, 7, and 8, and 1 Corinthians 13, that's the foundation of the body of Christ. And from time to time, we have to pick it up, look at it, and, and help help adjust ourselves to get back in line with it. So that's um, what I wanted to give out tonight. I appreciate all of you. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, I don't know who somebody signed in. So I don't know whoever they are that signed in may not know that I announced tonight that we will cancel church Sunday because it's going to be in the 20th Sunday morning, possibly ice. But my main concern is it's going from the high 60s and 70s that we've had the last two or three weeks to the 20s and a chill factor of five degrees uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning and down in the 20s. And I don't want our church out in that, not having adjusted to winter weather yet. So we're having this New Year's Day service. It will be now, I changed it, it will be just like a Sunday service. Breakfast, 9.30, Bible study at 10, service at 11.30 after band practice at 11. So, so no one will have to be cooking dinner and miss the service. So since that's the only service we're having, so we'll have service that way. We won't have Sunday service. It will be taking place by this New Year's Day service. Um, so I hope everybody's got that. If there's any questions, everybody feel free to answer. Let me go. I'm going to stop screen sharing here and get back to where everybody can see everybody. All right. I wish everybody was here could be here Sunday Saturday with us, but I know that's not possible. Thank God we got a little bit of Zoom. We can Zoom in on each other and have these services. Uh, these virtual services are better than not having anything anyway. So I appreciate all of you. Uh, before we go, let's pray together. Pray for the Russellville Church. The whole Russellville Church is sick. Some got COVID. Some don't know they're going to get tested today. Some may just have the flu or colds, but they're just about all of them sick. Uh, Brother Maine called me from, from Lowell, Arkansas. They were going to be here Saturday, but 
their church has got COVID in it. So we need to pray for them. Brother uh, Cletus Benfield is in the hospital with COVID. He was thought to have had a heart attack, but he did not have a heart attack. And even though he's in his early 80s, he is doing somewhat better today. And they were going to try a new ex experimental drug on him that they say is working. They're going to do that today. I haven't heard anything, but let's pray for Brother Cletus Benfield. Um, and he's the pastor of Jacksonville, Tennessee, Brother Truman's brother. Um, we need to pray for Brother Ray Weaver. You know, maybe the reason I have such a feeling for Ray Weaver is because, you know, when I moved from Midland, Texas, to Springfield, Missouri, Brother Lineker sent Brother Ray Weaver in an 18-wheeler. They rented a 48-foot 18-wheeler trailer and sent them to me and Brother Ray. And who was it came with him? I'm trying to think. Somebody went with him from Little Rock. Brother Tally, you remember who that was? Mike Crafter. Okay. Mike okay. Crafter. Okay, Brother Crafter. Uh, maybe he's on here. I hope he is. Anyway, they went up there and loaded, if I'm not mistaken, the furniture for six families. And, and he drove that truck all the way back to Springfield, Missouri. <laughs> and by the time he got to Springfield, Missouri, this was in January of 1987. And they, we moved seven families from Midland, Texas to Springfield, Missouri, and started the church there in Springfield with seven families. And there was ice on the road and the brakes locked up on that trailer. And Brother Weaver, they had to, I don't remember how they did it, but they, they unloaded that trailer there on the road, somewhere wherever he had to park the thing. It took me a month to get that trailer fixed where I could get it back to, to Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, anyway, I didn't move my stuff in that because I couldn't leave my, my house. I was still trying to get my house ready to sell and everything. And so I moved my truck. I moved in February, but these six families beat me to Springfield, Missouri and moved there. We moved four families in a country, an old country house. Uh, that was Brother Durham and Brother Jerry York. And who else was it, Brother Durham? It was y'all and Brother Jerry York. And I can't remember. I know that, uh, was Brother Malone in on that group with y'all? Anyway, three of us families. For this we man. Huh? It was just um, the Sandra and Jerry and uh, our family. Okay. But you sure the Stantons, out. did the Stantons wasn't in on that group to start with? No. It seemed like he rented an apartment, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. He got, he transferred some way with his job or something like that. And so he rented an apartment. So there was two families moved in that farmhouse your family and Jerry York family. And then my family, Brother Malone and the Doug York family and Michael and Cindy, I believe all moved in that other house that we rented. We rented two houses, seven families of us lived in them two houses. I don't think them people we rented from knew we was doing all that. I don't know, but I know we all had to get driver's license. Everything was brand new in a new state. It was quite a deal that God helped seven families make that move. And we made it and God covered us and helped us. And we was in Springfield, Missouri from 1987 until I was there until 2008 when I became the pastor in January 2008 of Little Rock Church. I don't, I don't know if people realize that has been next, next month will be, well, in fact, January the 1st, Saturday, 
will be, what is that, 13 years or 14 years I've been pastor of the Little Rock Church. Of course, I started out with Brother Lenig, Brother Weiniger in 2002 when Brother Leniger died in November of 2002. I started working with Brother Weiniger. So I've actually been here 19 years. It, time goes by, Brother Tally, don't it? We're all getting old. You did know, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, anyway, so there. I nineteen. I went in nineteen eighty seven. We went to Springfield, Missouri. We was there until I I moved here to be pastor, and then it was a, a couple of years later before some of them there. I can't remember. I think it was like sixty people moved from Springfield, Missouri to to Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, I, I didn't ask none of them to do that, but I told them they could if they wanted to, and boy, here they come. So anyway, I'm thankful for all the people of God that's followed me around the country uh, these many years, but uh, I'm thankful for God's covering and the help that he's been to us. And I love this church here. appreciate the people of God. Pray for the work in the Dominican Republic. God is blessing the Dominican Republic. We've got like six churches that's come in since I was there last two years ago. And I'm planning on going over there next month in January. Uh, and brother, God's blessing that work over there. There's new churches coming in. And uh, I really feel the Lord and what he's doing over there. So pray for that. Pray for the brother Hugo Rodriguez and the work there in Brownsville, Mexico, Brother Bud's works. Pray for those works. And I've mentioned the work in the, the Keswick Church, Keswick, Canada. Brother Goss, pray for him. His, his, his health is failing him. And, and of course, any church suffers when their founder, when they begin to lose the strength of their founder. And of course, Eventually, all of us, all of our churches lose their founder. So they're down in that stage in that church. So help us to pray for it. The work in Montreal, Brother Galt has worked there for these many years. I've tried to help and work with him, but he's been faithful uh, to help the work in Montreal, Canada also. Brother Smith. Along with Brother McNabb for many years. And he's gone now, Brother McNabb. We've lost him. Yes, Sister McNabb. Uh, we got a call. We got a call from Brother David Paul yesterday. His fa whole family and half his church has COVID. Oh my! All right, we want to remember that, Brother David Paul. He's one of the one of the main ministers there in Montreal. So we certainly want to remember him and his family, and uh, pray for them. Um, any other request? I don't want to leave Brother Bill Daniels. I'm trying to remember him every service because I've just got it on my heart to pray and ask God to, to, to give him more time and the healing of this congestive heart failure that he's got in his body that he just can't seem to get over. And I'm asking God to, to do something for us. Remember little Valerie, little Mallory? She she still needs a touch from God. Did you know God's able to, to heal any condition in anybody? Even He's even able to raise the dead. So I don't have no trouble knowing that God's able to do anything. So let's, let's keep remembering, you know, the Fisher family, little, little Mallory, uh, you know, we love that family and love that baby and we want God to help us. Is there any other needs before we pray together? If not, I'm sure there's unspoken requests. Raise your hand if you got an unspoken request. Everybody does, I know. So if everybody would unmute and so we can pray together. It seems like to me it just helps to pray together where we can hear one another. And uh, uh, I'm going to here. Everybody, mm -hmm. Brother, I'm going to help make some of you sisters jealous. 
Sister Hunter Mark Board took Jerry, Mr. Sherry to, to Florida for Christmas for a Christmas present. They've been down there walking on the beach, holding hands together like a like little love bird. And yeah. they just got back today, so yeah. I'm glad for them. We're back now. All right, praise God. Let's give God the praise. Thank praise the Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank you, 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 Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Oh, 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 oh